Sophia Elizabeth Stone Lecture. Um, we're going to be commencing in a few minutes, but I would like to ask uh, if everyone please move up a little bit so that we can um, be able to see and hear more easily. And if other people come in, they can come to the back and they won't be interrupting the lecture as that goes on. So if you could do that, please, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see here. Okay, um, good evening and welcome. I, my name is Yingu Xie Yi. I'm the interim dean of the School of Library and Information Science. I'm delighted to see so many friends and students, faculty, and alumni, and fellow information professionals here uh, attending today's, uh, this year's Elizabeth Stone Lecture. The Elizabeth Stone Lecture is a very important event in the life of the school, mainly because that it helped us honor our former dean, Dr. Elizabeth Stone. It's also an, a, a very important occasion for us to do some fundraising for our students. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, I'm one of those four very fortunate individuals that, uh, get to, that got to know Dr. Stone very, very well. My friendship with her began in 1990 when I joined the school here as a faculty member. And it lasted until she passed away in 2002. And even, since, uh, even after she passed away, I continue to think about her often. When the school was in crisis, I thought about her. When school was, was very, very successful, I thought about how happy she would have been. And um, Dr. Stone was a tireless leader. Because of her leadership, our school was elevated from a department uh, to a school in, back in 1981. She was the dean from 1981 to 83, and she worked so hard, she almost lived in Mayor's Hall. <laughs> in fact, her daughter said to me, do you know that? I had to make appointments to see my mother. <laughs> And that's something I've been keeping in mind, I've been making sure my daughter will not say that about me. <laughs> um, but um, Dr. Stone, besides working very, very hard for our school, she was also the AOA president back in 1981, and she was truly a dedicated leader. In addition, she was very, very active in IFLA and promoting information literacy and also continuing education for, for our librarians. Uh, in addition to being a very effective administrator, she was also a very caring leader and a very, truly a very uh, kind person. As a junior faculty member, I, at the time I was the youngest faculty member uh, in the, on the faculty and uh, uh, it was very often that we had lunch together and talk about what's happening in our lives. But in addition to that, uh, one of the things that touched me deeply was that I, as a junior faculty member, I often work very, very hard and stay late. And sometimes I would hear this, she would come by she would knock on the door and to make sure I was safe. And then uh, some often she would come by with a cup of coffee and cookies and see how I was doing and making sure that everything's fine. And if I was not too busy, she would sit down and talk to me. But if she saw that I was clearly in the middle of something, she just left the cookie and coffee there and say, feel free to come to me whenever you want to. You know, and it was that kind of um, caring approach that really touched me. And uh, she also talked to me, uh, we also talk a lot about deans. <laughs> um, and one of the things that has uh, stuck with me is that she said, being a leader is really providing service. And a good leader will provide the best environment for people to be do their best work. And that's something I'm ex uh, inspiring to do. Uh, as you know, I got into the leadership position very dramatically, very quickly. Uh, and uh, thanks to the support of the faculty and the staff, we're doing very, very well. And uh, in the near future, we'll be providing some update 
uh, sending electronic newsletter to the alumni to help you know about all the wonderful progress we have made. But the school uh, is really doing very well, and, we're, and we have strong support from the provost. And I want to assure everybody that uh, you will see the school in the news and see us growing uh, in the near future. <clears throat> Um, Dr. Stone, besides being very caring and uh, in terms of the faculty uh, development there, she also cared deeply for our students. And that's why she started this Elizabeth Stone uh, scholarship. And I personally know about two cases that those two students would not have been able to complete, complete their degree uh, without the support from this particular fund. So I want to encourage you to think about it. You know, the, any, no donation is too small. Even if you are able to donate $5 or $10, it all adds up. And so uh, please think about our students because uh, most of our students are part-time students. And uh, in, because of that status, they are not qualified for the university-wide scholarship. But they do have needs. And so any contribution you make uh, will be very, very helpful to them. So feel free to uh, drop off your checks with our alumni representatives, or you feel free to mail the checks later to the school, and we'll process that for you. Okay. Um, I would like to, uh, the next thing I wanted to, to do is to introduce you to our next, speak, next uh, presenter, that's Jennifer O'Shea. And she's going to present the uh, <coughs> Ray Van Drain Scholarship, uh, sorry, Ray Van Drain Award. Ray uh, was an interesting person. I also was very lucky to know him fairly well. Uh, Ray succeeded, basically Dr. Stone served as the dean of the school from 81 to 83, and then Ray took over as the dean from 83 to 86. After that, he moved on to North Texas and built a very successful program there, and then he moved on to Syracuse and did a lot of interesting thing there, especially the, she started the uh, high school movement. Ray uh, was extremely intelligent, hardworking, and with great sense of humor, and very, very caring, and he cares about the school a lot. Uh, we still, even after we, uh, he left, we stayed in contact, and he, he monitored the, pro the development of our program. And um, his, what's so special about Ray is that he emphasized innovation. You know, he encouraged innovation, he encouraged people to, to collaborate, to work, to work across interdisciplinary uh, lines. And he, even though he passed away so quickly, but he did uh, leave a, a strong mark and had great impact on our field. So I will, without further ado, I would uh, bring Jenny up to present this, uh, this year's Ray Van Drain Award. Can you hear me? Okay, very good. I'm so glad that uh, Dr. Shayi's had a few words to say about uh, Ray Van Dren, who she knew personally. Um, I didn't have the chance to know him while he was here um, back in the 80s, but I uh, was able to read some of the remembrances that his uh, colleagues had of him here at SLIS and at Syracuse. And uh, definitely he was, they all mentioned his great sense of humor and um, his strong collaboration. As you mentioned with the iSchool Consortium that he was very uh, vocal in founding. Um, and as well, just his colleagues talked about how, you know, he would start every meeting at Syracuse with, they would all clap in unison just to make them feel like a team. And they all said, you know, we were meant to be a faculty of one. And that's sort of the collaborative, collegial approach that, that he brought to his work. Um, and unfortunately, he did, um, he did pass away in 2007. And it was soon after that, in uh, 2008, that Sliss started this award to commemorate his time here and his contributions to the field at large. So this now, our 2010, is our third annual uh, Raven Von Dran Award. And uh, as we mentioned, the board awards it to an alumnus who exhibits innovation, collaboration, and leadership in their career in the spirit of Raymond Von Dran. Uh, this year, our recipient is Barbara L. Post, who's here with us tonight. I'll bring her up in just a moment, but I would like to read a few words from her colleagues who nominated her for this honor tonight. Uh, she, we had a number of nominations from her, a total of seven people signed off on nominations for her. 
um, and they all just really uh, wanted to talk about her innovations. She's a transportation librarian. She's been a real leader and innovator in the transportation library field. And uh, 201, her colleagues all talked about how she's just a wonderful colleague, a wonderful mentor, and uh, just a very generous person to work with. So I want to quote from a few, of the, a few of the things that she does in her work, and then a few of the things that people had to say about her. Uh, in her work at the Transportation Research Board, which, from which she'll be retiring soon, uh, she's responsible for the Transportation Research Information Services Database, which is the largest online bibliographic database of transportation research, uh, which is just key to the transportation field. Uh, she was also involved in the initial development of the National Transportation Library. She's been active in the Transportation Division of SLA, the Special Library Association, and just over the course of her career, her work has made transportation information, which used to be really hard to come by, uh, accessible, relevant, and just essential to researchers in the U.S. and worldwide. Uh, a couple of words about her work in founding the, or getting help to set up the National Transportation Library back in 1998. Uh, one of the people who nominated her for this award uh, had a few words to say about that time. Uh, Roberto Sarmiento, Sarmiento, who's the head of the Transportation Library at Northwestern University, uh, brought us back to that time. Uh, he said, it's important to note that Barbara helped develop the vision for a federal government organization for which there was no frame of reference. In addition, she had to help develop the funding for a library that had no budget. She helped articulate staffing needs and helped in the selection of the staff. And once this literally new library was up and running, she helped assure its success, success by developing and sharing the TRIS online version of her database, which the NTL then used as its cornerstone product. And this database has really been key to a lot of the nominations that came in. Um, it's an essential resource for transportation folks worldwide. Uh, Sarmiento said it was the most important transportation information resource in the country. And he said, its impact can't be underestimated. All serious, pretty much all serious transportation research conducted by federal or state governments and academic institutions sooner or later has to go through TRESS. And talking about innovation, he talked about how, you know, it's gone from a dialogue resource to a CD-ROM to what it is now, which is a web-based database that's accessible to people worldwide. Um, and just to paint the importance of that, he says, Barbara's management of TRIS has helped strengthen our nation's infrastructure and helped our citizens have access to information that otherwise would not be available. Uh, another person I'd like to mention is here with us tonight, Nelda Bravo who also nominated Barbara. She's with the Federal Highway Administration. And uh, as I mentioned, transportation information used to be really hard to get. She said, through her leadership, Barbara has changed the landscape for transportation information. She talks about how over the years, government, international, and information users everywhere have come to rely on the databases that Barbara manages. And her quote, these changes in how we approach information are the result of Barbara's willingness to collaborate within her own organization and with sponsors and users. Her openness to new ideas and the use of new technologies has created an open and innovative environment for information exchange. And really just the overriding theme from all seven of the nominators, they all wanted to talk about how wonderful she is to work with. She reaches out to colleagues and she brings colleagues and information together. Uh, a few words from Rita Evans, who's the library director of the Institute of Transportation Studies. Uh, she wanted to talk specifically about Barbara's work with uh, SLA. She said, she's always willing to share her time, energy, and resources to benefit the transportation research community. Her collegial approach, grasp of the big picture, and focus on service delivery have served as an excellent example. And then Ken Winter of the VDOT Research Library. There never seemed to be a question too large or small for her. And if she didn't know the answer, which was rare, she not only knew who would know, but she would make the appropriate introductions and later follow up to be sure you got exactly what you needed. That kind of willingness to help has made her indispensable to me, and I know my peers echo that sentiment. And then just a couple more. Um, Eileen Boswell, who's also here with us. Uh, she is a more recent graduate of SLIS. She graduated uh, last year. And she's now with the Community Transportation Association of America. Uh, she met Barbara Post while she was a student here through a class assignment. And then Barbara really went out of her way to welcome her into transportation librarianship. Uh, she had some wonderful sentiments to say. 
just how important it is. She said, it matters that local library leaders communicate in such a kind and open way to bridge the generation gap and welcome new librarians in, especially in a subspecialty where many people are not new and have been benefiting from Barbara's expertise and kindness for a very long time. And one final quote from uh, Roberto Sarmiento. He said, I believe all librarians deep down want to make a difference in our organization, profession, and if we are very fortunate, the world. Barbara Post has made a difference in all three, and our world is better for it. So you can see her colleagues just really love working with her. What a treat to introduce Barbara Post. Please join me in congratulating her. She is the recipient of our 2010 Raymond Von Dran Memorial Award. Barbara. How wonderful. Thank you so much. I was really surprised and honored when I received the email that I'd received the Catholic University Von Dran Award. I'd always appreciated the quality education I received at Catholic, but I never expected that, that I'd get anything like this. I want to thank my colleagues and friends, Eileen Boswell, Jessica Fomlant, Nell De Bravo, and others who can't be here for taking the time to nominate me. Raymond Von Dran, as you've heard, was known for his innovation and collaboration qualities. I admire, these are qualities I admire in information professionals. He also was known for his sense of humor and for enjoying life. He is a person I would have respected as a professional and liked as a person. That makes this award more meaningful to me, and I thank you all very much. I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker for tonight, uh, Clifford Lynch, who will be uh, speaking to us today, uh, has taken time from his busy schedule to come and talk to us. Um, Clifford is the director of the Coalition for Networked Information since 1997. Uh, he, this CNI is jointly sponsored by the Association of Research Libraries and EDUCAUSE, which includes about uh, 200 member organizations uh, concerned with the use of technology and networked information to enhance scholarship intel and intellectual pro uh, productivity. And I know from my own experience, when I was going to school uh, relatively recently, that I always enjoyed reading Cliff's uh, work and kind of following him, and it's an honor for me to meet him here and then to hear his presentation. So without further ado, Clifford Lynch. Can people hear me okay? No. Okay. How's that? Better? That's for the video. Sorry. Oh. Oh, you're on both. I see. Sorry. I, I just had it explained. This one is for the video folks primarily. So. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight. And I have to say, I was a little daunted when I looked through the list of folks who have given this lecture over the past 20 years. Uh, there are some very distinguished people there, um, although perhaps the one that left me uh, most humbled was the first one on the list, Tim Healy, uh, who is someone I had the privilege of knowing a little bit when he was at the uh, New York Public Library back in the, back in the day. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful man. I'm going to talk tonight about some sort of big, broad issues. And necessarily in a you know, 35, 40 minute talk, um, uh, this is going to be sketchy. But I want to leave you with some sort of big picture thoughts about how the practice of scholarship is changing, both in the sciences and the humanities. To 
get you to think a little bit about some very kind of abstract issues like what constitutes the cultural record and why do we care. And then to talk in my final bit about the role of libraries in carrying this forward and in particular some of the very substantial challenges and policy choices that I believe face libraries and especially but not exclusively by any means research libraries as we roll into this strange new world of the 21st century. So let me begin with the question of what supports scholarship. Um, and here I think we see three things that interpenetrate that really are essential prerequisites for the ongoing conduct of scholarship and the building up of scholarship from one generation to the next. The first is the scholarly record itself. This is something that's fairly well understood. It's the journals, the books, um, the papers, the conference proceedings. Nowadays, all of a sudden, it's taking on some curious new dimensions as we find the method sections of papers replaced by much more effective and much more illuminating videos on YouTube as we see um, uh, video in general and uh, talks becoming a much more commonplace way of conveying scholarship, uh, particularly emergent scholarship. As we see interesting developments like blogs as places for collective problem solving, um, we see the emergence of virtual organizations and virtual environments where scholars can come together to work through some particular question, analyze data, author together. That scholarly record is at some level pretty well understood. Um, it's been primarily the, um, the uh, responsibility of research libraries and academic libraries to deal with that. There's a second element which has changed drastically, I would say, in the past decade, and that's the data that underlies that scholarly record. Used to be that the amount of data that you could actually put out and share with people, if you go back 200 years, was terribly constrained. You, you know, might have a few tables in a paper. You might have some charts. Um, and of course, you know, there are some places where we just never learn. We still have graphs today in our journal articles, and we still have graduate students who undergo the torment of go working back from the graph to guessing the xy coordinates of points and re-entering them in an Excel spreadsheet so they can reanalyze the data. You would think that we could do better than that today in a scholarly journal, but indeed that piece of progress has been very, very slow. But data in general was a scarce resource. There were certain data archives that supported scholarship, whether it was scientific, um, for example, uh, collections of observations from planetaria, tidal tables, other kinds of things that um, found their way into natural history museums, species collections for those interested in uh, systematic biology and biodiversity or botany, those kinds of, of things. We had some of that, but now in the last particularly 50 years, we are living in what's increasingly being referred to as a data deluge. Um, all of a sudden, uh, digital technology um, in every form, uh, remote sensing, gene sequencing, combinatorial chemistry, um, uh, uh, synoptic surveys um, in astronomy, endless kinds of things are producing an enormous flood of data. And all of a sudden, we now find these enormous data archives being recognized as being of real value in the building of the scientific record, in the 
uh, reproduction of experiments and the reanalysis of data, we're seeing this recognized as a fountainhead of real value, a collection of material that's every bit as important, sometimes indeed more important than the journal articles that discuss it, to um, preserve and to share in an orderly fashion. You see the science agencies now, um, the funding agencies, actually regarding scientific data as a first class product right along with those publications. And you see these funders pushing scientists now to establish ways to ensure that the data is preserved, properly described, curated, and reusable. The point is not just to save it, but indeed to facilitate its reuse. That's what it's all about. And of course, we can't save all data. We face a complex set of trade-offs about what data do we keep and for how long. Some of this is judgments about reproducibility. For example, if you want to know the boiling point of some chemical, you could remeasure that. There's a cost associated with it, but you could do it again. If you're interested in the um, range in which um, some plant occurs in nature across time as climate alters. That's not reproducible data. Once that's gone, it's gone. There's some data actually that takes on ethical dimensions. For example, um, it's pretty hard to justify discarding data from a clinical trial that put human beings at risk under the presumption that you've got plenty of human beings, you can you know, kill off the control arm again um, uh, you know, in a few years because you're too cheap to save the data. Um, it's, a, it's a complex calculus and one that we don't fully understand. One of the things that's happening today is that we're struggling with how to put the institutions in place to take care of this data management and curation and stewardship. Um, another thing that's happening that's very significant and closely related is we are renegotiating in very elaborate ways the relationship between the published scientific record, if you will, and the underlying data. And those now interpenetrate in ways that allow you to move from articles to underlying data back to other articles that allow you to place things that are cited or exhibited in a scholarly article into context. For example, um, imagine a small picture of a galaxy in an astrophysics journal. You'd like to put it in context of a sky survey to see what's around it, to see what other observations you have of that object, perhaps at other wavelengths or other times. So you have this whole set of apparatus that's starting to develop that interrelates and positions data and um, scholarly literature. One of the things that I need to underscore here is that thus far I've drawn my examples primarily from the sciences. This kind of data and computationally intensive scholarship is also happening in the humanities. Um, it's happening in a, I would say, in some sense, more creative and more erratic way in the humanities. Um, whereas in, for example, molecular biology, the idea of sequencing genomes and looking at um, uh, you know, single nucleotide uh, variations and stuff is pretty well established method. You find digital humanities to be an area of considerable controversy. Um, is this real history? Is this real archaeology, real art history, uh, real linguistics? Um, uh, you know, how do these methods relate to older problems? But we see amazing things happening. For example, we're starting to develop large corpora of human expression across long periods of time. Think about things like the JSTOR database or the Google Books database. And all of a sudden, we can take computational views of how language and the ideas expressed in language evolve, how they rise and fall over long periods of time, um, how 
metaphors move from one author to the next, there are astounding things that we're starting to understand we can do with this. So this is not purely an issue for the sciences. This is an issue for scholarship of every kind. And there are a lot of other pieces that come into this. For example, as we see this new kind of computationally enabled scholarship, it is uh, in some ways a very democratizing effect. So you actually are seeing a rise of what's variously referred to as amateur science or citizen science, um, uh, where um, uh, observers who do it for the love of it, amateurs, um, work with professional astronomers and are sort of the frontline observers in many cases. Um, you certainly see this in trying to understand biodiversity in parts of archaeology. Um, in other areas. And actually, if you look at it in the right way, I believe you can make an argument that even more powerful than this resurgence in amateur science, we're seeing a sort of a resurgence in amateur humanities. Um, it's one that sits very uneasy with the professional scholarly communities and the humanities. But I think it's quite reasonable to view the interests in things like genealogy, uh, um, local and family history, material culture, um, and similar sorts of developments in ways that are very similar to the amateur and professional scientific collaborations. And it's very interesting now to see this sort of collide with some of the traditional concerns of the humanities. This is an area we could certainly spend more time on. But as I said, I want to sort of go sketchily at a high level here and, and give you an impression um, across a wide range of things. So. So far, we've talked about two of the three parts of the evidence to support scholarship. We've talked about the scholarly record, and we've talked about the underlying data. Um, the third part, which you could argue actually is also a sort of an overarching phrase that might subsume the first two, is this amorphous thing called the cultural record, the record of human thought and activity and creativity and dialogue. This is a record which we've historically viewed as greatly privileging text in most of our institutions. We make an exception for certain kinds of art, statuary, painting, um, things of that ilk. But it is predominantly a textual one. And that record, which is not produced primarily by scholars, but often by political figures, intellectual figures, artistic figures, regular people caught in great events, um, all sorts of folks, that is a very, very vital part of our record going forward and is essential to the kinds of inquiries that we need to do for future scholarship. It's very scary to look at how that record is changing. And let me just give you a few examples and be thinking here kind of in the background as I walk through these examples about how well have libraries, archives, museums, and similar cultural memory organizations collectively done at dealing with these events over the past, the, these changes over the past, let's say, 110, 120 years. So here's a way to characterize what happened in the first three quarters of the 20th century. And I don't want to bicker here about start times and end times. I realize you could probably accurately take this back to, let's say, 1850 and walk it forward. Um, but um, there's, a, there's a certain matter of scale here that took a while to get going. So what we learned to do, starting in 1850 and taking it to a peak by around um, 1980 or so, 
is to capture a tremendous amount of things that were formerly ephemeral. So we learn to capture images through photography, which of course set art off in a completely um, novel set of non-representational things because prior to that, art had to a certain extent been used as a substitute for photography because we didn't have photography. So all of a sudden we had this ability to record events visually and to disseminate them and to save them. We learned to do this with sound through various kinds of sound recording. Um, that did weird and, and amazing things to the whole way in which music related to society. It led to a, what some people have argued was so, is sort of a winner-take-all version of producing music and took it largely out of the hands of, of the amateurs. You know, there was a time before sound recordings where a lot more people played music at home. Um, not necessarily as well as the very best people in the biggest cities, but um, they did it. And now they listen to the very best people in the biggest cities often. So that changed everything. And then, of course, we put the two together and learned how to deal with a time dimension. And we made movies and videos and television and learned to capture all of that sort of thing as well. Those, were, those three things were very, very powerful in making the formerly ephemeral, the things that used to rely on people's memory and their use of language to recount that memory into tangible objects that became part of the cultural record. And of course, uh, you know, as I indicated, they transformed all the arts in very powerful ways. Um, drama, they created new arts like cinema, music, uh, painting, uh, all, of, all of those things changed. So nonetheless, we had this sort of funny high culture, low culture thing. We had this privileging of text. We had archives and libraries mm -hmm. and museums that were very slow to recognize the legitimacy of photographs, of sound recordings particularly. Photographs had this kind of evidentiary quality, but um, sound recordings, especially of music, were entertainment. Um, and you know, we, we struggle with this question of, you know, where does entertainment fit? Where does culture fit? And how do these two coexist in the cultural record? And you know, we're okay with culture, but we're not so okay with entertainment. Um, you, you still see this kind of smoldering with debates about, well, why is the public library <coughs> getting DVDs and circulating them? And I don't mean DVDs of like really boring things that you might get assigned of homework. Um, I mean like movies. Um, and people, you know, this is very controversial in some towns. And you'll, you'll see still today debates about this, just as you used to see debates about whether they should have music other than maybe a little bit of really boring music that's good for you, um, you know, that's really old. Um, We really weren't quick to catch up on these. And yet, think about this as you know, what we're looking at now. Certainly, a lot of our great library collections, a lot of the very important parts of the cultural record are personal papers or organizational papers that were donated to an archive or a library special collection and then organized and curated. And you know, once upon a time, they were papers. They were 40 boxes of assorted manuscripts, and there might be the odd photograph in there. Today, if you talk to people at our major research libraries, both here and abroad, you will find that the special collections folks are in a sort of low but steadily escalating state of panic 
as they look at what's coming in the door. Because remember, what comes in the door there is always kind of in the rear view mirror because it sits around for a while. So right now, they are enjoying things like the, um, the debauch of consumer media in the 1980s and early 1990s. You know, every strange form of floppy disk ever invented and every obscure word processor that was, you know, done by a little company that went out of business um, in 1982 uh, is represented in these things. Um, and actually, you know, you get a kind of a um, malformed impression of, I think, how bad formats are going to be. If you look at textual materials in the, let's say, 1995 to 2005 range, that environment is a lot more stable. There are a lot less kinds of removable storage. There's a steady move towards managing bits independent of storage media. And there really aren't that many word processors out there. Um, so it actually gets a little better in that regard. But you're, you're seeing these sort of wonderful collections come in now that are this hodgepodge of paper, early bits of, of media. Often you, you've got consumer media in the act too, um, sound recordings, 16 millimeter film, cassette tapes, um, all manner, eight track tapes, uh, uh, you know, all manner of wonderful sorts of things, um, beta cartridges. Uh, you also find people had in, have interesting practices. So, for example, this is one I really enjoy. So, there, there are a number of people who write books for a living, basically, who have given or sold their archives to major research libraries. And they have these practices where when they start a new book, they buy a new computer. When they finish the book, the computer goes in the closet and they buy a new computer and start a new book. So they have, you know, actually a series of machines that are associated with specific books in their career. And if they need to go back to it, you know, they'll try and boot up the old machine that's been in the closet for five or six years. And, you know, sometimes it, it boots. Um, you know, the, some of the old Macintoshes are really rugged um, if you're not, you know, trying to connect them to modern networks or something. Um, so this is what's coming in now, and it's really scary. Um, if you look, though, and there have been some very good studies recently about, you know, sort of what's on your laptop, what's, what's in your personal digital life. The um, British Library has been running a major project on this for a couple of years and has a very nice report out. Um, there are researchers like Kathy Marshall who have done um, beautiful ethnographic studies in this area. Um, you start learning scary things about people's personal backup practices. Um, uh, and, and actually, these have evolved noticeably over the, let's say, 10 years I've been tracking this. Um, if you go back to, I don't know, like let's say 2001 or so, you actually find that many um, sort of uh, people who use compu used computers casually um, at home um, had this sort of fatalistic, almost apocalyptic view of them where, you know, every few years come the flood and most of your stuff goes away and you never get it again and you start fresh. And this is sort of a good thing and sort of a bad thing, but it's just the way it is. And now you see, of course, a lot more systematic attention to backup, in part because the computer manufacturers have made it a lot easier. Think of something like Apple's Time Machine, um, which you know really makes it sort of automatic to have backup at a certain level. But if you look, for example, at those desktops, um, let me just sort of sound the alarm about photographs. Your average person who's not a photographer by trade, who's giving you their boxes of stuff today, representing you know life pre-2000 um, fundamentally, um, isn't going to have a lot of photographs in there. They may have a few hundred. They might even have a couple thousand. 
It's not uncommon now to see people running around with, you know, 50,000 photographs on their hard drive. Um, now that we've got phones integrated with cameras, now that you've got a camera with you almost all the time, the culture has changed. And images are abundant in a way that is utterly unmanageable um, using the kind of technologies we've historically used to manage images. I mean, there are a few things that are going to help us a little. For example, we're picking up more context now. Um, we're picking up information about when was an image taken and where was it taken through uh, various kinds of geolocation. We're actually seeing some wonderful software starting to show up that can photo mosaic images in various ways or identify places that appear in images and cluster images around this. So there's hope for this, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very different world than the sort of descriptive approach to images we've struggled with historically. But images and increasingly video now are utterly abundant in, in a way we couldn't conceive of it before. So dealing with things like this is very much a part of getting real about the cultural record. But again, think about trying to look forward rather than look backwards. Where are people's digital lives today? Only a piece of it's on their personal desktop. It's smeared across dozens of services out there in the cloud, across social networks, across Flickr, um, all, all kinds of places. And even their mail often is not local. It's in Gmail or somewhere else in the cloud. Um, you can get a little taste of the problems we're looking at when you read some of these articles about parents or spouses trying to clean up after the sudden death of a family member where that family member basically didn't leave a digital will with a clear set of executors and passwords and user IDs and they're trying to get this from some of these folks who run services out in the cloud. Um, this, is, this is the sort of looming cultural record that we're going to need to deal with. And it, it operates on several levels. One is the individuals, but the other is the relationships. Um, the linkages between individuals. If you just took all the pictures out of Flickr um, and organized them by individual without the commentary and the linkage, you'd lose something very significant there. There's more we could say about that. Um, again, I will simply conclude this by saying that the cultural record is something we need to really think broadly about and there are pieces of that that are totally without precedent and some of which are in private and corporate hands. And we need to think about whether some, what to do with some of these things as they get old. For example, um, some of you may go back, I'll just, I'll just give you one example here. Um, some of you may remember back when MCI emerged on the long distance scene. And one of the things they did there was something called calling circles. And the idea was they could analyze your phone records and figure out who you were calling and whether they were MCI customers. And they'd give it to you really cheap if you, you know, got your friends or family to convert to MCI to stay within the circle. Now, that required a level of computing power that was just emerging at that time. Um, basically, the ability to casually compute over large numbers of call records. It's not that nobody did it before, but it's that you had to want to do it pretty badly. You had to be like, you know, the government telling AT&T, I want to know everybody this guy called and then everybody they talked to um, uh, or something like that. It wasn't something you did kind of casually for marketing. I would presume that basically stashed away at this point, we have records of the source, sync, and duration of every phone call that's been made in this country since 1990 or so. I don't know what we're going to do with it. I don't know whether that should constitute part of the cultural record. I don't know whether if we anonymized it in some fashion, 
it would make sense to consider that as part of it. But um, th there are all kinds of these edge cases, and we need, to, we need to really think about this with fresh eyes and also look at what we can learn from the past. Um, things like train schedules, which used to be printed mm -hmm. ephemera and found their way into archives and libraries and places like that. Um, throughout the early parts of the 20th century until they turned into databases a few years ago. These are actually very useful for scholars. You can learn a lot about the connectivity between cities, about um, commerce and um, uh, uh, corporate activity and various things. They're useful resources. They're all gone now. Um, you'd have to make a very deliberate attempt to save that. And we're probably not. Uh, so we need to think through some of those things. So all of those things, I would suggest, roll into the responsibility of libraries to manage the cultural record in partnership with archives, museums, historical societies, probably public broadcasting, and a few other entities we don't have good names for also play a role here. Um, we've got a lot of challenges. One of the challenges is getting libraries to step up to this, to build up the expertise and the investment. Right now, as I indicated, there's a great sort of debate going on about who's going to be responsible for that scholarly data, and where is it going to live, and how are we going to finance its preservation and reuse. And some research libraries are moving here aggressively. Um, in some cases, the scientific disciplines are doing things. In some cases, government agencies are. Um, uh, but it's, it's very clear that to the extent that um, libraries remain relevant to science as anything other than purchasing agents for journals, they're going to have to get serious about engaging this collection of evidentiary data. Um, I just don't see any way around it. There's another piece to it, too, and this is a piece that is particularly salient when we start talking about the cultural record broadly rather than evidentiary data or the records of scholarship, and that's intellectual property rights. One of the great disgraces and at the same time great triumphs of the last years of the 20th century is the story of the World Wide Web. It was, I would say, abundantly clear by 1996-97 that the World Wide Web was a very important part of that cultural record, a medium of human expression and interchange that clearly was having a vast impact and deserved documentation. It deserved permanent capture and preservation and curation. And what happened is the libraries looked at this and they rang their hands about copyright and they rang their hands about this might be too hard, this might be too expensive, it's impossible to do perfectly um, in some nations. The libraries moved to get legislation in place, um, although they still took forever at it, um, uh, to give them a clear path. In other nations, they mostly stayed in hand-wringing mode for the critical first years of the web. A private individual, a guy named Brewster Kale, who had done two startup companies, set up with his wife and a couple of like-minded folk, a thing called the Internet Archive. And he basically said, this is too important not to do. And because of him, and because of his willingness to act unilaterally and say, OK, well, so sue me, and we'll you know, work this out if we have to, um, we have, as a society, meaningful records of the web at scale from about 1996 on. It's really only in very recent years that, let's say in the last five, that 
um, the established libraries have gotten serious about working here. This is not the kind of mistake as a society we can afford to make repeatedly. Um, the stakes are getting too high and the objects to be preserved are getting too complicated. Um, hoping for heroes like Brewster Kale every time we need one is no way to maintain a culture. Um, it's wonderful when you find them, but um, it's terrifying to predicate a cultural memory on this. It seems absolutely clear at this point that we need to have a conversation, and that conversation has already been started, but it needs to be re-engaged with new vigor about the interactions between copyright and the ability to manage our cultural memory. Um, it's easy to get tangled up in issues about access here, but there are some issues that are very fundamental, I think, about being able to maintain memory as a society. I think dealing with this intelligently also begins to take us back to questions of access and exactly what corpus of material are we relying on libraries to give us access to? What are the sort of key things? You know, we speak very glibly about the rights to access to knowledge. This is actually a very nuanced kind of idea about is it access to scholarship? Is it access to know-how? Is it access to culture, to entertainment, to education? All of the, to, to uh, is it access for the purposes of accountability of individuals and institutions. All of these things weave into this question of the access that various parts of the cultural memory system provide. And I don't think we can resolve some of these preservation and access issues without a really much more nuanced and honest analysis of how those play against this evolving cultural record. I think, though, that unfortunately, we've waited till it's very, very late. And the need to move on preservation is terrifically urgent. We've, I think we've got to find common ground to be able to move ahead there while we sort out these knottier problems, even if, sadly, some of those archives may need to remain dark or highly constrained for a while. And I want to say a last thing, because uh, I don't want to embark at this hour of the night on a detailed legal analysis of copyright and how we've um, made a series of bad legal decisions here. I think that some of this is much deeper than what the law says and is probably too important to be left to specialists who are accustomed to fiddling with the copyright law and trying to fine tune various aspects of it. I think that we really need to talk about some of this in terms of basic cultural values. That there is a cultural value to being able to maintain some sort of coherent memory of our society and what it's doing. And that that sits as a social imperative that parallels the kind of propertizing um, uh, imperatives that have driven so much of the discussion about copyright in recent uh, generations. I think we actually also need to get institutions and individuals to recognize memory as a value. Why shouldn't it be reasonable for institutions that have collected material of long-term cultural interest to pass them off to a memory organization. We should be making that easy, not difficult, but we also should be making it a uh, something that's recognized as a good and benevolent and appropriate act for institutions and individuals to pass this heritage on rather than to lock it up. 
Let me just conclude by suggesting that as I think about this set of issues, it seems to me that libraries and the allied cultural memory organizations are this sort of pivot point, this, this nexus of negotiating about how we construct and manage and preserve our cultural memory and our cultural record. That's really part of what's at play here and what kinds of access expectations we have around that record. That's the sort of, that's a big piece of the social contract that libraries serve as the sort of visible sign and executor for. And I think that that's a social contract that really could use some revisiting now, some dusting off, some attention. Um, we're in a world that's changed tremendously from a world of 150 years ago or even 50 years ago where we could still get away with privileging text and privileging paper um, in, a, in a very, very um, strong way. We, I think, are at a juncture now where it really is time to gather people from all disciplines and all perspectives to think about what really ought to constitute a cultural record and a cultural memory and how we're going to enable our memory organizations to organize and preserve it for us and what kind of access expectations we have around it on what terms. And I think that's where I'm going to stop. I hope that I've given you some sense of a big framework for thinking about at least some of the potential futures for libraries in the 21st century. And more importantly, perhaps even than that, some notion of what's really at stake here and the role that libraries play in dealing with this challenge and this opportunity mm -hmm that the 21st century cultural record brings us. Thank you. Now, how are we, how are we for time? Okay. Okay. So I'm told that for once I didn't run way over time. Um, <laughs> Why don't I take one or two questions and then we can uh, go for these goodies back here. Yes. Um, I wonder what your take would be on the recent acquisition by the Library of Congress of the Twitter archive. I happen to have been at computers and libraries tweeting about the TED Soup for electronic books and I heard about the Library of Congress acquiring the Twitter archive. Yep. But then we saw this raging debate on our listserv about the Twitter archive and what it meant. And I also worked at the Library of Congress and heard today about the challenge of the staff or ask a librarian even answering the questions about how people are going to access this and also all of the expectations that come from something like Twitter. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, okay, there are a few details that we, that we don't seem to know yet about exactly what they're getting um, in terms of tweets as opposed to some of the structure around them. Um, at least I haven't, I haven't seen all the details of that in the press releases and things that have come out yet. But I'll tell you, my first reaction, especially because as I understand it, and I don't know whether this is true, but these are the accounts I've read, the Twitter people actually approached LC. And that's exactly what I was trying to get at there with, you know, what a good thing for that company to do. Where, where are their colleagues at Facebook and MySpace and Google and Yahoo? Um, we need a line of these people going to LC. 
Um, uh, you know, here, here's another one that I chew on a lot. So blogs. Uh, most blogging is done on a very small number of platforms. And it would be very straightforward for those platform providers and it wouldn't cost them much of anything, to put a box on when you set up your blog that says, I'd like my blog archived with the Library of Congress, or I'd like my blog sent to the Internet Archive once a month. Um, we could actually, if we worked systematically, capture a tremendous amount of this stuff at surprisingly low cost. But let me come back specifically to the Twitter thing for a minute. So. There is certain, there, there was a certain amount of, you know, whining about the banality of Twitter and, you know, why are we capturing this, um, this thing? And I think you can argue on one level, it's probably worth capturing just because of the amount of time people burn on it. <laughs> um, in the same sense that um, it's worth capturing Anything that absorbs, you know, hundreds of thousands of human hours uh, a year, you know, we should understand something about that. Video games, um, you know, although I think you can actually make an argument that video games actually are a, uh, you know, a, a legitimate form of uh, art form or cultural expression form that, it, that are, are, are now highly adapted to the digital media and deserve preservation on, on you know, their own strengths. I sort of wish at one level, you know, they'd started with something with a little more, um, uh, a, a little more depth than Twitter. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, I think that, um, you know, we'll see some useful things here. Um, the, there, there's another point that's worth making. Um, one of the things that people are clearly going to want to do with that Twitter archive, and which I suspect the Library of Congress is horribly unprepared to deal with if they're like everybody else, is compute on it. They're going to want to be able to do um, uh, you know, relationship maps of retweets and things. I don't know if you've seen some of the analytic tools that are being applied to Twitter now and visualization tools. Um, I mean, I saw a thing in January where some people were doing an analysis of the role of Twitter in some of the um, civil disobedience that accompanied the Iranian um, uh, elections. And this was amazing. You could see these people like, pop up and people would say, no, no, don't retweet those because the secret police are watching this. You know, and, and on the one side, this was an amazing tool for visualizing interaction in a community. But then you realize, yeah, and there are probably some very nasty people sitting in a basement, uh, you know, over there watching this and then sending out, you know, folks to round up uh, Twitterers and uh, disappear them from time to time. Um, so, um, you know, there, there are unquestionably things in Twitter of, of real historic importance, but we need, in many cases, to be able to compute on that database to, to extract and illuminate them. Um, the last thing I'd say is that, at least based on what I know about um, uh, and have read about this, this is not an expensive undertaking. I mean, Twitter is a text database. It's little. Um, you know, the, the, this thing probably needs, I don't know, you know, five, ten thousand dollars worth of storage that needs copied from time to time. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the basic archiving of it is not big. Now, um, figuring out how people are going to use it and if you're going to let them each download, you know, the 50 terabyte Twitter corpus every time they want to fool with it, um, that's going to start running to bandwidth and cycles. But the, the, the raw archiving of it is, is actually not, uh, as far as I can figure, a super high priced item. Um, it's, not, it's not like, you know, um, weather data or um, the Large Hadron Collider or something. Um. I'm wondering, um, one of the things you're talking about seems to sort of reminds me of Gordon Bell. He wanted to record every yes. He's wanted to record every, pretty much every instant of his life. What seems like what you're advocating is from a cultural or social aspect, trying to sort of take that idea mm -hmm. to a social level.
critical reflection mm -hmm. on how we are representing ourselves, mm -hmm. primarily individually and in this space, in, in the digital space. And he's basically saying we're trying to put, we're trying to digitize ourselves and lose some of our humanity that way. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one of the things we don't talk about very much is how much we're comfortable with capturing and passing on. Um, I mean, Gordon is, Gordon Bell, who's a very eminent computer scientist who's now at Microsoft Research, he's been running a project for a while where he's basically digitizing all his personal records and taking lots and lots of digital photos and things like that. And um, you know, so he's sort of built up a digital archive of a lot of the records of his life. But um, at the same time, you know, I think you can argue what he's doing is is very sort of surface level, um, you know, big deal. So he's getting rid of a lot of paper and digitizing it. Um, you've got people now running around with um, wristwatches that take their heartbeat, blood pressure, and stuff like that every couple of minutes that they downloaded to their computers. Do we really want all that? Um, you've got um, you know, things that keep track of every time you turn the lights on and off in each room and where elevators go. I mean, the, the amount of data out there, particularly this kind of telemetry stuff, is mind-boggling. Then there's a whole nother class of uh, you know, sort of surveillance stuff with all these closed circuit TV cameras and all of this. The, the amount of financial telemetry you emit as you wander around um, is astounding. Uh, you've got all this GPS locator data coming out of your phone. So, so really we need at some point to start talking about just how much of this do we keep and for, and for what. And I think that, um, you know, really at some level, um, uh, the stuff that Gordon's doing, while it's provocative, is, is really only scratching a tiny bit of the surface. And that's one of the reasons why I argue we really need to kind of think hard about, we, we've got a lot more candidate things for a cultural record now than we ever did. And we need to think about which ones we roll in and which ones we're just going to make go away or we're going to say the normal behavior is to make it go away and you know if you're particularly concerned on a personal level about you know giving your heartbeat readings for the last 40 years to your children that's nice but you know um, this is this is sort of idiosyncratic to you um, the the stuff that Lanier argues about is I think somewhat more complicated and deeper and um, I can't say I've fully digested his arguments at this point but he makes for example some very interesting um, <coughs> arguments about mash the level of creativity that is implicit in various kinds of mashup and reuse and I'm not sure he always does that fairly if you take it over into um, scientific contexts, for example, where um, occasionally the essence of brilliant science is to take sets of data from disparate areas and bring them together in a way it's never been brought together before. Um, but, you know, I guess you can argue that, that certain kinds of know, musical appropriation, for example, have the same kind of character, whereas a lot of the, you know, sort of mashup you see is, is really much more trivializing. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, some of his discussion, though, about hive contributions, um, the, the sort of Wikipedia model where authorship is, is invisible and collective, um, as opposed to really a strong statement of an individual or a small number of identifiable collaborators is very intriguing and raises some very provocative questions about um, different kinds of authorship for different purposes. Um, so I, I, think, I, I think there's some really um, 
provocative stuff in, in, in some of his arguments. Um, we'll give you the last question. Oh yeah, there's a ton of activity. I mean, when you look at the um, the scientific data stuff, that's highly international, and um, uh, you know, the UK actually has been a real pioneer there with their e-science programs going back to the mid to late '90s. They actually, I would say, got out well ahead of us in the states in in this for various reasons. There's a lot of activity at the EU level as well as um, uh, various national level things in Europe. Um, there are activities going on in Asia. I'm much less familiar with them. Um, uh, I just don't get to that part of the world as much. Um, Australia has made some major national investments in repositories, in network infrastructure, in research data management over the last three or four years. And I mean, they're a relatively small country population-wise compared to us, but um, they've really been making some smart investments and um, uh, uh, we've got a lot to learn from what they've been doing. Um, so there, there, are, there are lots of other people playing in the scientific area. Now in the cultural realm, it gets more complicated. Um, there's that project that I alluded to at the British Library, the Digital Lives Project, which has been a real path breaker, I think, um, uh, internationally. Um, and there's some scattered other stuff in the UK. Oxford is doing some interesting work. Um, some bits of things in Europe um, in this area, but the, the, this whole sort of personal archives thing is still fairly disorganized. Um, in terms of cultural memory and, and talking about that, that's an area that you know Europe has historically been a little more comfortable with. So you see developments like Euro Europeana, um, which is their big cultural heritage database. Um, uh, and some of the stuff on a national level that rolls up into Europeana. Um, you see some very interesting things in some of the smaller countries' national libraries where the national library um, basically declares its role as twofold. One is the, um, the uh, published output of that nation, but the other is the worldwide output in the national language. So they pick up various diasporas and um, um, uh, remnants of colonial um, activities and things like that. So you see you know, some of that kind of thinking in places like some of the Scandinavian national libraries. Um, and you know, they, they're dealing with small enough populations that once they get their act together, they can do things pretty comprehensively in a way that's very hard for a Anglophone mm -hmm. nation, um, uh, a primarily Anglophone nation and uh, a big one. Um, so there's lots to be learned out there. Again, there's some interesting stuff going on in, in Asia that Chinese are starting to make some quite significant investments, as I understand it, in digitizing cultural heritage material there, although I can't say I know the details of it um, at all comprehensively. I've seen a couple of talks they've given that, that are interesting. Um, so yeah, this is, this is one that's got some national scope. And I think with that, we should make sure we get some of those goodies before uh, the price closes. Thank you. I think this is a challenging time for libraries, but it also this is also a time uh, we actually have a lot of opportunity to assume leadership in shaping the culture and developing a greater appreciation 
for preserving scholarship and cultural records. Uh, so I want to thank Kim again for giving us this opportunity and to share with our staff. I so also forgot that actually earlier I meant to uh, have a shout out to our friends in Northern County. Uh, Professor Shoemaker and his class are actually in Northern County listening to uh, the, the presentation here and watching the video. So, hello everybody over there. <laughs> um, so, without further ado, what I would like to do is to open up for you to go back to the back to uh, enjoy the food and the company of everybody here. And thank you very much for coming.